Okay, everyone, I think it's time to get started. Thank you all so much for coming today. I'm really excited to see you all here, and I'm especially excited to be back at GCAP. How's everybody doing? Second day of GCAP? Everybody good? Yay. <laughs> So um, this is actually my third GCAP, which I can hardly believe. Uh, the first time I came out was in 2016 as part of the International Speakers Program, sponsored by the very lovely people at Film Victoria. And when they offered to pay my way out that first year, I had no idea I was going to love it so much that I'd be super excited to come back on my own dime every year after that. But um, this is a pretty amazing community of people, and it's really an honor to be part of it. Um, it's only once a year, and every time I come here, it really feels like coming home. So I just really want to thank you all for always making me feel so welcome. Um, you now, because I do love this group of people so much, I really wanted to come up with some kind of topic that I thought people might find useful. So I kicked around a lot of different ideas, and ultimately I landed on this one, how to make contracting more profitable and less sucky, if you're being really honest about it. Um, when I came across the results of the 2017 GDAA survey, which I'm guessing many of you have seen or perhaps participated in, and what really caught my eye was this question of what kind of companies are here. Now, no huge surprise to anybody in this room, but Australia doesn't have quite the large game studio presence that you often find in other parts of the world. So the vast majority of, of teams reflected in the survey seem to fall into two camps. Coming in at 45%, you have the classic indies. These are teams that make all of their money from the sales of their own IP. And then uh, hot on their heels at 42%, you have the pro indies. These are teams that do make their own games, but they do that in combination with some kind of professional services or contract work. So I thought 42%, that's a lot of people who might want to talk about contracting. But it's actually a little bit higher than that when you factor in the service providers and contract developers. So that brings it up over 50%, about 53. And there's also a good chance that over time, some of those classic indies might convert to pro indie because you don't always know where you know, your funding is gonna come in so, or how well your game is gonna do. So I thought, okay, cool, let's actually talk about contracting. Because the harsh reality of contracting is you can be the best team in the world, but if you don't know how to ask for the things that you want or know what your options are, chances are you're just not gonna get the things you need. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about some strategies to making the most out of contracting. But before I get into all that, I should probably introduce myself for those of you who don't know me. So I am Amy Dallas. I run Clutch Play Games out of Portland, Oregon. I'm also on the board of OGA, which is the Oregon Games Organization, which is a little bit like Film Victoria, but just smaller and less successful, but we're working on that. Um, my team, Clutch Play, has been around for about seven years, and we are a decidedly pro-indie team. And in fact, in the last few years, we've probably been more pro than indie. We do have a couple of our own games out, and we have a VR title that's in development. But for the most part, uh, the core of our business is doing engineering consulting. And we work with a lot of larger game companies and film studios on the west coast of the United States. And uh, some of the clients that I have I can talk about, and unfortunately some I can't. Someone posted this to Twitter the other day and I'm like, man, I need like a purse full of those for every conference I ever go to. Because as everyone knows who's done contracting, sometimes the coolest stuff you work on are the things you actually can't talk about, but you can actually negotiate for that, possibly. But again, contracting has been really important for my team and I because much like uh, a lot of the companies here, um, <clears throat> we don't have a large corporate game studio presence where we live. So, <laughs> as I mentioned, I am from Portland, Oregon. I have two Portlanders here of the heads of a very cool studio called um, Beardo. You should check their stuff out, it's super weird. Uh -huh. Because we're Portland, we like to keep it weird. So how many of you have actually been to Portland other than these two? Yay, my people. Um, so if, next time you come to Portland, if you ever get there, come check it out, we'll, we'll hang out together, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do the town. But for those of you who've never been, the way I often describe Portland is it's pretty much like if San Francisco and Seattle had a demented, slightly runty baby, that would be us. And um, like I said, our motto is keep Portland weird. As you can see, you know, we, we, we pretty much have that covered. 
That guy at the bottom is the Unipiper. He rides around on a unicycle in a Darth Vader helmet playing the theme from Star Wars out of flaming bagpipes. He's almost like the mayor of Portland. <laughs> and uh, it's just a great West Coast city. It's got you know, great food and booze and coffee and all these weird group activities, like the naked bike ride, which I've never been on, but I have been stuck behind it in traffic, which is not as cool as it sounds. <laughs> you kind of have to be in the right mood for the naked bike ride. And we have things like SantaCon, or once a year, everybody gets dressed up like Santa and goes on a giant pub crawl, which is great for the kids, right? Because nothing says happy childhood Christmas memories, like hundreds of Santas puking their guts out on public transportation. So that's kind of fun. A little Yuletide cheer. But again, you know, for all of its charms, no corporate games industry. So when I left EA in 2005, I, I pretty much thought my games career was over. So I did the next best thing, and I spent some time working in tech consulting companies, doing web app and software development. And as much as I miss games, I'm really glad that I got to spend that time, because I learned some kind of nuanced things about contracting that I'm not sure I would have learned had I stayed in games. And I also got to work on some cool brands. But it was actually just the experience of being outside of games and seeing how other industries handle consulting was really useful. So I'm going to talk about some of the lessons I learned from that time today, as well as some other weird tips and tricks I've picked up running a consulting studio. So today we're going to talk about things that get in the way of success, compensation structures for work for hire projects, and random pro tips that every contract team should know. So I want to start off by talking about <clears throat> barriers to success, because I think that fits pretty neatly into the theme of this year's GCAP, right? The walls we build ourselves. And then more often than not, it's our own crap that gets in the way of achieving our goals when we're doing hard things like uh, doing biz dev or negotiating contracts or handling clients. And I think the biggest way that we do that is by allowing fear to drive our actions and decisions and behaviors. And it's really easy to do that. It's easier than you might think, because often fear is kind of weird and insidious in that it can d disguise itself as something other than what it is. Now, in order for me to explain what I mean by that, I need to take a moment to kind of codify how fear works in the brain. And I need to preface everything I'm about to say with the fact that I'm clearly not a neuroscientist, right? I'm a studio head and I'm a producer by trade. But it may impress some of you to learn that I am, in fact, a world-class procrastinator. That's true. So uh, when given the choice between, I don't know, approving six months' worth of timesheets or putting in my expenses that I've been avoiding for the last several months, or looking up random shit I find fascinating on the internet, I'm going to pick random shit on the internet like 85, 90% of the time. And uh, I do find fear particularly fascinating because fear and stress are actually synonymous. And if you don't know how to control fear, then you don't know how to control stress, and often it can control you without you realizing it. So I've done a lot of research on this, and I want to kind of lay out what I've learned about how fear works in the brain in the visual language of my people, game developers, and that's, of course, the flow chart. So here is my understanding, my non-neuroscientist understanding of how fear works in the brain. So let's say some shit happens. <laughs> some kind of stressor occurs in your life. And it gets taken into your brain uh, through your five senses. That's the sensory system. It takes that data, and it decides where to route it. So your sensory system can route it to one of two places. In the event that this stressor is familiar, familiar to you, it will route that data to the cognitive system, more specifically the prefrontal cortex, which is the top part of your brain. It's pretty much the command center. This is where your working memories are stored. So information about that stressful thing that's happened goes into your prefrontal cortex, and your brain says, oh, yeah, that sucks. I know exactly what this is. Here's how we handled this last time. Here's how we're going to handle it this time. And you take care of the problem. But it's also entirely possible that the stressor that's occurred in your life maybe happened at a time where you were already agitated or stressed or feeling overwhelmed or maybe it was something really scary and unfamiliar. In which case, your sensory system could very possibly route that data down to the limbic system, which is actually kind of like your caveman brain, I think it's, it's often referred to, in that your limbic system is charged with 
taking care of your survival needs. So if you remember the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the limbic system is pretty much concerned with that bottom rung, the things that, that you need to keep yourself alive. So the first stop in the limbic system is actually the thalamus, which is kind of like the traffic cop, you know, keeps things moving. By the way, that's the cop from the village people, if in case you didn't recognize him out of context. Because I chose him because I thought that guy's totally going to know what to do in a crisis situation. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's the thalamus. And the thalamus then takes that data and moves it on down the line to the amygdala, which is pretty much the cornholio <laughs> of the brain. And then its job is to ask and answer one very important question. Are you threatening me? I could do the accent, but I'm not going to. Um, so if the answer to that question is yes, then that data gets kicked on over to the hypothalamus, which often is referred to as the lizard brain or the reptilian brain, because it, it, it doesn't have a lot of complexity, the hypothalamus. Its job is actually to keep you alive by triggering one of two protective responses, and that is fight or flight. And yes, that's the Trump baby balloon, by the way. And weirdly, I actually had a dream about Trump last night that he was giving me advice on this talk, which is really weird and disturbing. <laughs> I, you know, as if I'd listened to his advice on anything. So anyway, fun facts about fight or flight is that your body has absolutely no ability to differentiate between a threat that's real versus one that's imagined. So let's say you're home alone at night and you're in bed and you're half asleep and you hear the sound of breaking glass downstairs. Now, it's entirely possible that your cat just knocked over a lamp and it's equally possible that it's a maniac breaking into your house trying to kill you in your sleep. Your body does not care what's happening. It's gonna flood with adrenaline and you're gonna do one of two things. You're gonna grab your phone, lock yourself in the toilet and call the cops or you're gonna look for a weapon and run downstairs to investigate. And one of the reasons why you're able to act so quickly and decisively is that in addition to triggering fight or flight, one of the things the hypothalamus does is actually it knocks out inputs from the cognitive system. And it does this by design because it doesn't want you overanalyzing a situation. If you spend too much time going, hmm, hmm, is that a maniac, is that a cat? You could wind up dead. So what's also interesting about limiting that access from the cognitive system is that's actually where a lot of your analytical thought process, processes occur. It's also where creativity lives. It's where empathy lives and compassion. So none of that is in play when you're in fight or flight. Other interesting things about fight or flight, um, you know, I've always thought of it as, as a very literal thing. Like fight or flight means you're running or gunning. It's one of those two. But fight or flight, the more I've come to understand it, is something that you can actually get caught in without realizing it. You can, you can be triggered for a fight or flight response even when your life isn't being threatened. So what are some signs that you might be in a fight or flight reactionary mode? Well, usually it's characterized by a strong visceral emotional reaction to a stressor. And in the case of fight, it could look like any one of these things. All of that, the anger and aggression, it's actually fear. It's your brain's response to something really scary. So what does it look like for flight? Well, maybe something stressful happens, like your client calls and says, I'm canceling your project. It's pretty scary. So you just shut down. And you just think, I can't deal with this right now. This is too much for me. Things like feeling anxious, depressed, overwhelmed, feeling hopeless, pessimistic, like why bother, there's no point, everything's crappy, it's flight. There's another one on this list that kind of hit me where I live. Procrastination actually can be a form of flight. So there are times that I know I procrastinate because I'm bored and my brain just is like, mm, I need something more interesting to do. But sometimes, I'll be honest, I procrastinate because I'm scared because I'm working on something that's so scary and difficult that I just, my brain just goes, you know what, I'm gonna protect you from potential failure. Let's go look up random shit on the internet, right? So it's pretty fascinating when you see all the different ways that fear can be controlling your behavior in ways that are not conducive to achieving your goals. So, what does this look like in a biz dev context? Well, it looks like scarcity, for one. Not enough good going around. 
not enough work out there for us. It looks like self-doubt. I don't know what I'm doing. It looks like fear, rejection. All of this stuff is fear. And everybody, by the way, who's ever done any biz dev has felt any one or all of those things. It's, it's pretty common because biz dev is scary and it's really stressful. So what does it look like in the context of negotiation? Well, it looks a lot like a lot of hopelessness and pessimism. So obviously when you're in fight or flight mode, which many of us can be when times are stressful, um, it's not really conducive to getting the things done that you want when you're trying to do the stressful parts of consulting. But um, you know, there are some ways you can override that. Now remember, one of the jobs of the hypothalamus in addition to triggering fight or flight is actually to um, cut off access from your cognitive system. So from everything I've come to understand, one of the ways you override fight or flight is you try to re-engage the cognitive system or the prefrontal cortex. And that's not as hard as you might think. And it involves a couple of steps. So when you feel that strong visceral reaction to fight or hide, um, recognizing that you might in fact be in fight or flight mode is the first step to re-engaging the analytical part of your brain. Also taking a moment to stop and question your instincts, like if you're sitting there going, gosh, um, there's not enough work out there for us. Stop asking yourself, well, is that really true? H have I done everything I can possibly do to find work? Or if you think, oh God, I'm terrible at my job, you have one of those moments of self-doubt, asking yourself, is that really true? Is there any empirical evidence to suggest that I really am terrible at my job? Uh, again, all of that question and answering stuff is your cognitive system waking back up. And also focusing on your goals is a really important part of re-engaging your cognitive system. And um, when you are doing biz dev or contract negotiation, there are a lot of things to focus on other than your fear. So just thinking about what is something I can do today to make the situation better. Uh, that in and of itself will, will help to bring those systems back online. So I could spend a lot of time talking about fear because I do find it deeply fascinating, but I need to move on to some other stuff. Um, but I would say um, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this today is that um, you have to know fear so that it doesn't prevent you from not being able to see all the options on the table. So now that we've kind of overcome our fear, let's talk about different ways to structure projects around compensation. I want to start off by talking about the most common, which actually happens to be my least favorite for games, and that's the fixed bid. So I'm guessing most people here probably know what a fixed bid is, but in the event that you have not been so lucky, uh, a fixed bid is basically a contractual agreement to provide a specific set of services for a specified price or price range. So everything you need to know about a fixed bid is really encapsulated in the words specific, specified, and you know, uh, pre-agreed if you're talking about a timeline, trying to get something done in a pre-agreed timeline. Um, so these projects are generally uh, milestone-based as far as um, billing goes. And uh, like I say, they're not my favorite kind of compensation structure for games for a whole host of reasons, but they do actually have their charms. So because you do so much upfront planning, ideally, you start the project with a very clear understanding of what the scope is, the, what the budget and schedule are, and uh, you have a very detailed set of milestone deliverables with clear acceptance criteria. So in doing so, it provides a lot of predictability and transparency for both your team and your clients. So your team knows exactly what they're building and your clients know what they're getting, when they're gonna get it, and how much they're gonna spend on it. So who wouldn't like that? And again, so much planning generally means that you and your team get a little bit more autonomy. So if you don't like a lot of client hand-holding, fixed bids are usually great for that. Also, these projects have the capacity to reward efficiency and innovation. I don't see this happening a lot in games because so often when we have extra time on a project as game developers, we just wanna spend it making the best possible game. But theoretically, let's say you have a job that you've bid out at 1,000 development hours and you get it done in 800. Under the fixed bid model, you get to bill for the whole amount whether you work that or not. 
And theoretically, your client should be happy with that too because they got something earlier than they expected. But also, if you do go over and you end up spending 12 or 1300 hours, the client doesn't care either because their price is the same no matter what. So this is why this model is so common because clients love it. It really reduces their risk, but not so great uh, for us. Whoops, sorry, I jumped ahead there. Uh, not so great for us as developers. Um, it's really easy to underbid a project because more often than not, we're asked to submit bids under intense time pressures with less than uh, detailed information than we need. So another thing I don't like about these projects is that they do uh, lack flexibility. So when your ability to get paid and have a profitable project is dependent on managing to a specific scope, you have to learn to become very comfortable saying no all the time. Nicely, but you still have to say no. And sometimes you have clients who don't want to hear you say no, and sometimes that can lead to an adversarial relationship, which you never want to have when you're consulting. Also, I find fixed bid projects to be pretty antithetical to collaboration. So whenever you hear a client say, we really want to work collaboratively with you, tell us how much it's going to cost to do this as a fixed bid, you have to pretty much say no, because collaboration on a fixed bid ends when scoping ends. When the planning phase ends, there's no more collaboration. But also, I think one of the biggest problems I have with fixed bids is they don't really often account for the complexities of game development. So this is one of the things I loved about working in tech. It's really easy to run a tech project because as a team, your ability to be successful is predicated on three things. Is it on time? Is it on budget? Did you nail your scope? With games, we have this other factor of is it fun? And it is sometimes really hard to schedule fun, right? Because fun sometimes involves iteration. It involves collaboration and flexibility. And if you don't have that, then that's potentially problematic. But all that said, I don't necessarily think um, that you know, fixed bids are the end of the world. Chances are, if you do these kinds of work for higher projects and games, you'll spend at least some time on one of these projects or more. So it's really important to know how to mitigate the risk. And one of the most important things you can do to mitigate risk is have a producer or a project manager on your team. One of my producer panel people are back there from yesterday, so I know I'm gonna get an amen from her. But um, producers are sometimes in the indie world seen as a, a luxury, and they're not, they're a necessity. They have a very big job because they not only have to um, run the project and the team, but they also have to manage client expectations, which is incredibly difficult sometimes. And uh, I actually did a, a long talk about a lot of these things in great detail last year called, uh, in a talk I did at GCAP called Upshade Creek, Managing the Unmanageable Project. So if you wanna learn more about different ways to mitigate client risks through doing uh, a lot of reporting and project management, uh, I think it's up on YouTube, so if you have nothing better to do with an hour of your time, you can go check that out. But um, I wanted to kind of encapsulate some of the necessities um, of risk mitigation through reporting here today. And one is you have to do status reports when you're doing any kind of client work. You have to, you have to, I know it sucks, we don't like it, but having that kind of visibility is critically important. Status reports uh, should be consistent and they should be unflinchingly honest. So generally my status reports include what the team did last week, what's going well, what's not going well, um, what's at risk, and any open action items on my side or my client's side, just so we have a lot of visibility. Now, another thing that I highly recommend that your status reports have every week are things like out-of-scope requests and trade-off tracking. Out-of-scope requests are gonna happen on every single project. I've been a producer my entire adult life, and I've never had a project where someone has not asked for extra stuff, ever. It's just a reality. And so it's really important to keep track of those in your status, not only because you wanna make sure you don't lose track of them, but also because more often than not, we can actually find ways to, uh, to accommodate requests as developers. And I do recommend that if you can find ways to squeeze in little out of scope requests um, without impacting your scope, that you do, because I'm a big believer in under promise and over deliver, that's a big uh, core principle in keeping your clients happy. 
Um, but when you do that, you got to keep track of it, and you've got to keep that visible to the clients. Because at some point, they're going to ask for one thing you can't do. And it's really easy to say no when you can say, but look at all the things we did do. So it kind of shows that you actually have been committed to helping them when you can. But you know, when you can't, they'll understand. So that gives them the, the opportunity to either go with a change order or trade something out. So when clients do make a trade, and this does happen often, that's another thing that has to be noted in status and, and carefully um, put down in writing. Because misunderstandings never happen against one's own self-interest. So it's very likely that you'll get to the end of the project and the client will say, yeah, where's that thing right here, the line item on that original scope? I don't see it. And, you, and if you actually try to say, well, remember we had that conversation, they're going to go, no, I don't remember. So you need to have it in writing. Um, so if you've done your job well, doing the status reports and keeping things visible, Change orders should not, never be an unhappy surprise. They should be a choice that the client gets to make to add something that they want. Uh, another thing that's a pretty important part of risk mitigation is acceptance criteria. Um, I don't know how many of you have actually used acceptance criteria in your projects. I highly recommend you do. Basically, um, these are the conditions that a software product has to meet to be accepted by the client. And so often, since payment is gated by acceptance of milestones, it's really important that your acceptance criteria is um, clearly defined with pass-fail results, it has to be pretty clear and concise, and it has to reflect your shared understanding of what each milestone should be. Also, these things generally need to be time-boxed. So you don't want to give the client too much time to sit on a, a milestone to review it. Generally, we give our clients about a week to two weeks. Um, and if they're reviewing a milestone in the middle of the project and they don't accept it within that time period, we just stop all production and we focus on what's wrong or why they haven't accepted it. Because things start to get a little dangerous if you keep developing and they have not accepted that milestone. Now, um, another thing that is a huge huge uh, factor in risk mitigation is um, selling the client on the idea of a discovery phase. How many of you guys have heard of discovery phases? A few of you, yay, excellent. Um, they're not as common in games, they're very common in tech. So if you're running a software project or, or web or app dev, most clients are happy to pay for a discovery phase, which is basically a deep dive requirements gathering uh, phase of the project, where you sit down with the clients and you go through um, all, all of their requirements. You talk about what their goals are, what the potential risks are, what resources they can bring to bear, what roles and responsibilities will be, and then you go away and you distill that down into a bunch of documentation. Now, discovery phases can last, um, I don't know, depending on the size of the project, um, they can last anywhere from you know, two weeks to six weeks, generally. And they're not cheap. The first time we actually sold in a discovery uh, phase for a client, it was about, I don't know, $40,000. So that was a big sticker shock for them. And they're like, I don't know if I want to pay you $40,000 to actually do a bunch of planning and discovery. That we haven't ever had anyone ask us to do that before. But basically, we were able to start selling clients on the idea of discovery because it actually reduce, it reduces their risk as well. So in this particular case, the first time we sold in a discovery period, we had a client who had a very, very tight deadline. They had to get something done in a very short amount of time. And they also had a very small budget. So we basically said, you know what, the only way we can guarantee that we can hit your timeline and hit your budget is by doing a lot of intensive planning. And so we did that. And in this particular case, when I say short timeline, this was a, a, a project that required us to get an MVP out in 12 weeks, including a month of QA. So it was, it was hardcore. And not only were we able to do that, we actually finished a day or two early, and the client didn't think we could do it at all. And it was all because we had the time to actually plan. So discovery phases, one of the keys to selling this idea to clients is actually focusing on the deliverables that are part of a discovery phase. 
So basically, discovery at the end of that time period, you should have uh, some design documentation, an extremely detailed project plan, including uh, task breakdowns, detailed schedule and budget with milestone deliverables, and some tech technical documentation. And sometimes we'll have a, a, like a small rudimentary prototype as well, if we have time. So discovery phases are really great. They can save you. And um, they're not that hard to sell the, to the clients if you can actually help them understand the value to them. So if any of you actually are interested in learning more about how to sell clients on discovery phases, just come see me afterward or reach out to me on Twitter or something. I'd be happy to work with you on that. Now, there are also going to be times where fixed bids just its not the right model. Maybe the client actually needs you to jump in and solve problems for them, but they don't really know exactly what they need you to do, or they need a lot of flexibility and collaboration, in which case there are some other options. You can also run a project as time and materials. And basically, that's an arrangement in which a contractor is paid for the time they work and the materials used, time and materials, right? So basically, that's an hourly engagement. So you're just selling them a block of time to solve their problems. And the good thing about these projects is, because there's no milestones, per se, usually it's monthly billing. So it's great for the developers, because we have consistent cash flow. And uh, you know, as, as I say, good for projects that are not well-defined and require a lot of collaboration and flexibility. So all in all, these can be great things but they also have some downsides as well. So these projects don't reward efficiency, so maybe if one week you have 40 hours of work to do and you get it done in 35, your reward is you get to start next week's work earlier, or you don't get to bill for that time. So that's not always great. But the biggest kind of downside of doing time and materials is that clients often perceive this to be a, a massive risk to themselves. So it's a little bit like whenever I talk to a client about time materials, um, they'll say, you know, well, that's like giving you a blank check, and that terrifies me. And I can understand that. If you ask a builder to come to your house and do some work, and they're like, yeah, uh, I'm going to come to your house, and I'm going to work until the job's done, but I don't know how long it's going to take or how much money it's going to cost. That would obviously be pretty terrifying. So it's kind of a not an easy sell always for clients. But there is another option, and this is something that I learned by working in tech as well that you can also do time and materials as a not to exceed project. And this is very common outside of games. Um, and most of the projects we do at Clutch Play are time and materials NTE. So basically, this is a time and materials engagement that has a cap on it. So you have a maximum that you can charge the client. And uh, if you need to go over that, then you need to talk with them about a change order. And this has been kind of a godsend for a, a lot of you know, our clients. They actually have really liked this model. It's not been as hard to sell them as I thought. The benefits of this kind of project is that there's no specific commitment to a detailed scope. So generally, the client is asking you to come in and work with them for a set number of, of time for which they will pay you a chunk of money. So that allows you to be a little bit more collaborative in how you work with them. I mean, it gives you that flexibility that you don't have on a fixed bid, but it also gives them some predictability of cost. So generally, when we work on a fixed bid project, often a client will come to us and say, uh, you know, we need to get something out really quickly, and uh, they'll give me their budget, and I'll tell them what I think I can do within that budget. And as these kinds of projects also require a lot of unflinching reporting, because the client is never going to want you to be wasting their money, so you have to work with them very closely to make sure that what you are doing is mapping to their needs for the project. Uh, and one of the ways I've actually found it really easy to sell projects on this is, is um, when we do fixed bids, I spend a lot of time saying no to the client all the time. And so when they want to do another engagement, I'll say, wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to say no to each other all the time, but we can still work together? collaboratively, well, this is how we'll do it. We'll do it as time and materials not to exceed. So this is kind of a lifesaver uh, if you're doing contracting. And again, if this is something you want to learn more about, about how you can sell your clients on this, um, I'd be happy to meet with you afterward. But um, I am running a little low on time. So I want to kick it over to random pro tips for contract teams. 
I still have a few minutes here. And I want to start off by talking about negotiation. Because as indies, there's a lot of misapprehensions that we often have when it comes to negotiating a contract. And often it comes from the power differential that's often at play. So especially if you're working with a larger company, it's really easy to feel like, oh, I'm little and they're huge and they have deep pockets and legal departments and I'm just this person who runs an indie studio. So there's, you know, how am I gonna negotiate with them? And they do nothing to dispel that rumor generally or that, that um, way of thinking. Because often when a contract is presented to you from a large company, they do it in such a way that, that makes it seem like there's not gonna be any back and forth. They'll kind of present it like, here, sign this. So you kind of go, oh, well, I thought we were gonna talk about some things. And that's actually, what they're doing there is a technique called the assumptive close. Have you ever heard of that? It's really interesting. I use this all the time on my husband, I have to say. So the assumptive close is actually a way of asking a question that makes it seem like the answer has already been decided. So let's say you've got a dishwasher that's full and you want someone to unload it and your husband walks by and you're like, can you unload the dishwasher? So that's one way of asking that question to which he might say, yeah. But he could also say, yeah, no, I'm not going to, I'm busy. But if you say, hey, honey, you're gonna unload the dishwasher, right? makes it sound like there's no argument to be had. So that's often what happens when you're dealing with a contract. They'll slide it over to you and kind of make it sound like there is no back and forth. But generally speaking, there's always room to negotiate as long as you have a clear understanding of what your goals are. And that really involves being clear on what you have to have and what you can live without. So generally speaking, some of the things that are pretty easy to negotiate with clients are things like payment terms. Often with larger corporate studios, they'll have terms like net 60 or net 90, meaning you have to wait 60 or 90 days until the day they receive your invoice to actually get paid. But I pay my team at the end of every month, so that kind of sucks. I don't want to have to wait that long. So this is one of those inviolate things that I have to have in a contract. Um, I, I don't sign contracts that are under net 30 or over net 30. And it's actually easier than you might think to, uh, to get clients to, to agree to some of these terms, especially when you treat them like, an, like a, an ally instead of an adversary. That's a huge part of contract negotiation is making sure that you're not going into it assuming that they're gonna be working against you. Always assume that they'll work with you and they generally do. So as a human being, if you go to another human being and you say, gosh, we're a small company and we really need you know, to not wait so long to be paid, usually they'll be pretty nice about helping you out. Another thing that is a point of negotiation, as I mentioned earlier, are things like credit and attribution. And there will be times that the client just does not want to give you this option but if you are working on a project that would really benefit your studio from being able to talk about it, um, it might be worth giving them a sales discount to, uh, to make that more favorable to them. This actually happened with us recently. We've done a lot of work with a, a really amazing film studio and we've not been allowed to talk about any of it. And recently they asked us to jump in on another project and they asked if we could actually um, give them a, a break on budget because um, we were kind of coming into the middle of a, a project that was already a little bit over. And I was like, yeah, I'd be absolutely happy to help you with that, but I'd like something in return. And uh, we were able to negotiate being able to talk about this project when it ends. And the client was actually really happy with that because he thought he was getting something as well, uh, which he was. So uh, other things that are sometimes up for grabs in contracts are things like insurance requirements. For larger companies, at least in the United States, often there are pretty steep insurance requirements. Uh, we have to have errors and emission insurance on larger projects. And um, when we first started working as a consultancy, we had a, a pretty steep insurance requirement and we just didn't have the money to, to take on insurance. And so we asked if we could do a warranty instead and the clients were fine with that. 
Also, sometimes they'll ask for insurance requirements that don't make any sense, like um, things like network insurance. Like they want to make sure that you have some kind of ability to be covered if your network is breached. And we're a small company. We don't have a network. So I'm like, I, I don't really want to pay thousands of dollars for something that I don't, uh, I, I don't have and it doesn't apply to me. But you still have to have them remove it from the contract. Um, other things, cancellation terms are another point that you can actually negotiate with clients. Anybody who's ever had a project canceled in the middle with no warning knows the importance of uh, uh, having cancellation terms. Uh, a lot of companies will allow you to have a 30-day um, window. So they have to give you 30 days notice or pay you for 30 days if they're going to cancel the project. So highly recommend looking at things like that. Um, so there's a couple other things I want to cover. I don't have a lot more time. Um, another thing I think everybody should be aware of are things like incentive bonuses. And you might think, beware of incentive bonus. Who would be scared of a bonus? Well, the answer is people who know that they can sometimes be used for bad reasons. So larger companies will often try to incentivize you to work harder than you think is reasonable to get something done early. And they do that by offering you a large bonus, a large cash bonus. So let's say, for example, you have a project that is, you know, six months long, and they want to chop a month out of the schedule. So often they'll say, we'll give you a large chunk of money if you'll be willing to try and work to get this down to five months. Well, that sounds great, except it's very possible that you and your team can end up working nights and weekends for months, and you end up chopping two weeks out of the schedule instead of a month. And it's great news for the client because they actually get to, uh, you know, they get to get that two-week benefit, but they don't have to pay you. So that's not so great. Great for them, not so great for you. So generally, uh, we've had this happen a lot. I, I think the reason why I know that these projects are, or these kind of incentive bonuses are not so great is because I worked for AAA studios where this is often used as a bit of a bludgeon and it's not, not so good for uh, the developers. So um, generally on these kinds of, in these kinds of situations when a client has said, we will give you extra money to finish something up early, I usually say no, which shocks them. And the reason why I say no is that you know, I don't want to be distracted by trying to hit a goal that's unrealistic. Also, more often than not, when you're on a, a project where you're trying to go really fast, it's actually the client that gets in the way of you being successful at hitting those early dates. And so that can make you very angry when you're working a lot of nights and weekends to get something done and the clients are the ones who are keeping you from, from finishing early. That is uh, a recipe for a lot of angry unhappiness. So uh, generally speaking, when a client offers you this, I highly recommend that you just turn it down and pretend it doesn't exist. And in every case we've ever been offered a, an incentive bonus, we actually have um, been given it anyway because the client was really happy with the work we did. Um, we stayed focused. Uh, we were uh, very focused on having a good relationship with them as well. And in the end, they decided to go ahead and give us the money. So. Don't get distracted by things like that. Now, uh, I actually, I had a bunch of other stuff and I actually cut it out for time, but I do have a little time for questions. Does anybody have any questions about contracting? Hey. Uh, I have a question. So you were talking about different kind of um, scale of payables from a fixed price of the bid towards the TNM and then really TNM and TA. Do you guys always Always, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and generally speaking, um, our, our big film studio client, um, he was someone who came in later. We had a different point of contact and he left. So this new guy came in and uh, he'd been going over our previous contract and he was like, how did you get this contract? Because I've seen a lot of contracts here and I have no 
not seen one quite so favorable to a developer. How did you get that? And I'm like, I asked for it. And he's like, ha ah, ha yeah, no, seriously, how'd you get that contract? <laughs> and I was able to explain, well, we were asked to come in under really difficult circumstances to make a problem go away quickly. The client didn't know exactly what they needed from us. They just knew they needed help. So we jumped in and helped them. And we estimated the project. We actually consistently underbilled you because we didn't need all the time that we thought we were going to need. And so he's like, hmm, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> so then, then he actually approached me to do another contract. And he's like, so this time material's not to exceed. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good idea. So, you know, it's, it's easier than you would actually think to sell these products as long as you can sell them on the benefit that rigidity and game development are not always such a good thing. That is a good question. So basically you're saying, um, do we prefer longer term contracts or sh shorter? Yeah, so do you sign contracts and book your whole team for, let's say, a year or a year and a half in? Or do you, or do you like the, your one runway of contracts is like six months or eight months? Oh, ideally, I want to lock them in for a year or two years, definitely. Like We have, actually have a lot of long term contracts um, of teams we've worked with for years. In fact, one. Um, probably our longest term client we have. They brought us in for a three month engagement and literally it went on for almost three years. So every, every three months they'd say, okay, we want another three months. Okay, how about another three, three months? And that went on for a long time. So uh, it's usually with longer term projects, they start out as something small and they kind of balloon once trust is built. We do. We do quite a lot of that. Um, my team and I do a lot of firefighting sometimes, so we're brought in to make problems go away uh, and actually take care of maintenance. Um, those are not always the most fun contracts. It's much more fun to jump in and make a game from soup to nuts, but you don't always get those opportunities. But the, the longer term contracts actually are, are, are pretty good because they're a lot less stressful, honestly, and they're pretty consistent in terms of the money they bring in. Uh, you brought up reporting, which is like a really important aspect of writing games as well, like having an artist that you can report yeah. uh, every single week. Uh, how extensive do you keep the reports in artists? Because I think the problem I face as a producer sometimes is like, how much detail do I need to go into to get, make sure the client is like, Like, you're afraid of giving them too much information I'm because... Afraid of, like, I'm afraid of the time overhead of reporting. Oh. Because, like, like, yeah, sometimes overloading with information that might not be relevant. Do you have a template for uh, I, you know, That's a good question. I do change it up a fair amount, but honestly, I'm never worried about overloading the client with information. Um, I actually talked about this a lot in my, in my uh, Upshit Creek talk last year, that... One of the points of reporting is CYA or cover your ass. Yeah. And so it kind of doesn't matter if the client doesn't read it, that's on them, but you still have to take the time to report it so that you can say, this shouldn't be a surprise to you because every week I'm sending you this information. And one of the things that I've done that's actually been really effective in terms of getting the clients to actually read the stash reports is I make them as funny as possible. I stuff them full of weird gallows humor and so I can always tell that they're reading when they're like, yeah, that was really weird. <laughs> so, um, you know, that, uh, that can be a good strategy. But um, I don't think you can ever afford to feel like it's taking up too much of your time. It, the, the opposite is, is usually worse. If you don't take the time uh, and you, you end up not telling them something critical, then that can lead to a really unhappy surprise, either for you or for them. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. I was going to put that as a, as a pro tip. Um, when you're doing any kind of consulting, you have to do timesheets. You have to, you have to. Um, I make my team do it 
uh, timesheets when we're doing our own internal projects or client work. Doesn't matter if it's fixed bid or time materials, they have to do timesheets every single week. Um, and the reason for that is even if you have your team working full time on a project, let's say you know, you've got a six month engagement and it's, it's based on the assumption that everybody's working 40 hours, well, if you have to crunch and people are working 60 hours, then you need to be able to capture that information so that not only will you know how to estimate better next time, but so you know maybe you, at some point you might want to have a change order or you might want to um, reflect to the client that there was some kind of overage. So you really do need to do timesheets. Also, I find timesheets really useful because they tell me things I might not ordinarily know. Like, um, for example, if someone is crunching every week and I'm not necessarily seeing the output that I would expect for someone working uh, a lot of extra hours, then it tells me that something is potentially wrong. Like, are you just not spending your time well? Are you doing something I'm not seeing? Are you, getting, are you working too much and getting too burnt out? What do we have to do? Do we have to take some of this workload off you? So timesheets are really, really important. And everyone will hate you if you implement them because they suck. Even I don't like doing timesheets, but they are a necessary evil. Back there. Oh, that's all right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes they are, and sometimes they're not. Um, a lot of our contracts come from, this is one of the funny things about contracting and biz dev. People often ask, you know, how do you, how do you get the jobs you get? And often it actually comes from doing a good job on one of your other jobs. So the games industry is really small, and you work for a company, and eventually people leave that company, and they float off like dandelions, and they land in another company, and, and then there's someone else who thinks you're great, and then you can reach out to them and say, hey, is there anything I can help you with? And they're like, yes, I'm so glad you reached out. And that actually has happened for us quite a lot. So, uh, you know, just basically getting your foot in the door with one often leads to a lot more. That's awesome, because that's actually happening. Oh, good. Yeah, Excellent. Go oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yay, fun times. I used to work there. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Excellent question. Again, that goes back to reporting. So <clears throat> on every status report I ever send out, I have those action items for my team and for the clients. And those are actually really good for me because often from week to week, I, I might forget something that I told the client I'd do. So I'm like, ooh, crap, I got to run around and make sure that gets done. So every week, um, when I write status reports, it gives me a chance to run around and say, have we met all of our obligations? So it also gives me a chance to needle the clients if they're late on something. And so if, if they consistently don't deliver on something that was promised, um, that's going to show up in that status report for weeks. And if it comes down to the, client, uh, the project being delayed because of something on their side, they're going to be a lot more uh, forgiving of that. Um, so again, it, it really goes back to reporting. Yeah. Kind of a bit of both, actually. So we are, um, we have a, a good sized team, and periodically we have enough work that we need to add to that team. And even when we bring contractors on, I, I kind of feel the weight of responsibility to keep them busy at, at all times. Like, you know, when someone's joined our team, I feel like um, I want to keep, if they're good, I want to keep them forever. So if one project ends and I have some extra contractors, I'm like, ooh, I need to do some more biz dev so I can keep them busy. So does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs>
Any other questions? Cool. All right. Well, oh, one more. Yes, sir. We do, yeah. So um, <clears throat> the discovery phase, one of the most valuable parts of it to the client is actually this set of deliverables. And um, <clears throat> they are extremely detailed, and they do take a lot of time. And this is actually why it is so expensive. But yes, um, it should, as I say, it should include a detailed scope and schedule document, have all of your milestones listed, all your tasks. Um, and so basically, at the end of that, the client really does know exactly what they can expect from you throughout the entire project. So it is a lot of work, but it's extremely valuable. Any other questions? All right, well, thanks, everyone.